Right, on to this afternoon's session. Um, delighted to welcome Michael Kushner. Uh, title of his talk is The Jewish Contribution at Bletchley. Uh, I have actually visited Bletchley. I'm sure many of you have. I know what a wonderful place it is and how much good work it did. But the talk that Michael is doing, uh, I'll read out what is in our newsletter. Michael Kushner is now a lecturer of World War II Signals Intelligence and former guide at Bletchley Park which was the government's ultra top secret code breaking establishment known as Station X. Over 200 Jewish personnel worked at Station X, a number of which came from Eastern Europe and also Germany itself. Now, since many of the secrets have been revealed, this unbelievable story can be told. So Michael, over to you to tell us the story. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll share the screen to start with and then uh, we'll see Bear with me, so we'll just get this up on the screen. And tell me if you can see my... Yes, yeah, fine, Michael. Okay, and I'll just get my presenter view up so I know what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, well, uh, if you can hear me, and everyone can hear me okay, hopefully. Yes, yeah, I'm sure. Right, um, I'll just go through the first couple, just to give you an example, well, uh, who I am, it's already been said. I, I'm a former guide at Bletchley Park. I now work at the Bletchley Park National Museum of Computing, so I'm still there, and um, which is just about to reopen very soon, we hope. Um, the, today's talk is about the actual Jewish contribution to Bletchley Park that many people aren't aware of. Um, so you, many of you would have been to Bletchley Park. I give lectures at Bletchley Park and also uh, around the country to many groups like yourself. And I also talk on the cruise line with the cruise ships when they're working, that is, they're all moored up and floating about on the south coast at the moment. And um, I now, uh, as I said, work at the National Museum of Computing, which is part of Bletchley Park, also at Bletchley Park as well. And um, so let's talk about today's story then. Okay, today's story is called Bletchley Park, the Jewish Contribution. Now, if you see a modern David on a picture, you know that person is, is Jewish or those people are Jewish. If it isn't, they are not. Okay, so we'll go back to the very, very start, pre-intelligence um, days, right back to 1883, when uh, a house in northern Buckinghamshire was purchased by a Jewish couple, Sir Herbert Samuel Leon and his wife Fanny Leon, and they lived in that house for uh, 54 years when the family passed away the whole estate was sold to a property developer and the idea was to demolish that house and um, sell it and sell the house and sell the land and build housing estates there. So um, that house was a major contribution to the Second World War and we call the talk Bletchley Park the Jewish Contribution. I'll start by saying, have you heard the one about the Englishman, the American, the German and the Jew? Well, it's not a joke. They all worked at Bletchley Park during World War II. In fact, over 200 uh, personnel worked over, Jewish personnel worked at Bletchley Park during the war. Uh, today's story is not a Jewish story. It's a story about Jewish people who um, played their part in the downfall of Adolf Hitler. Not on the front line, not in mud and bullets, and not in sinking ships in the Battle of the Atlantic. Nevertheless, they played their part which was just as important and vital to the war effort. We look just at a few of those people today. Now, when people hear of Bletchley Park nowadays, and I say many of you have probably been there, they normally hear about the Enigma machine. Now, the Enigma machine was the machine that was issued to the vast majority of the German Army, Air Force and Navy during the Second World War. The Germans were told this machine, which is a cipher machine, what it does, it changes messages from plain text to a ciphertext, to an unreadable code. And they were told this machine was absolutely and utterly unbreakable. Well, I can tell you today, had it been used correctly, it probably would have been. But we're going to go back a little bit to in, in between the wars in 1919 to 1939, when the code breakers were all uh, originally located at the Admiralty buildings. Then we, they were moved to 54 Broadway buildings in London's southwest one, just opposite St. James's Park Underground Station. 
It was a small band of 100 or so code breakers and administrators that worked there. They were actually controlled by the Secret Intelligence Services part of the Foreign Office, TUNI MI6. Uh, they were actually called the Government Code and Cipher School, the GCNCS, uh, sometimes known as the uh, Golf Club and Chess Society. <laughs> Um, now, it was run by the chief of the MI6, and so the chief of MI6 in those days was Admiral uh, Hugh Sinclair. He was the uh, chief, he was in charge of the um, uh, secret intelligence services and in charge of the code breakers, um, known as the operational head, was Commander Alistair Denniston. Now, the question is, what were they doing in between the wars? Well, not an awful lot. Mainly they were keeping an eye on diplomatic telegrams, breaking into diplomatic telegrams, not only from our presumed enemies, but also from friendly countries as well. Um, they were involved certainly in breaking codes during the uh, Spanish Civil War. And uh, the government were also keeping an eye on an organization called Comintern. Comintern was a, a Trotskyist organization and they were trying to change the whole world to become communist by infiltrating the trade unions, the, um, the um, newspapers, the universities, and setting up uh, clandestine radio stations. But also they'd heard that the Germans were using, prior to the war breaking out, the Germans were using a new type of cipher machine called Enigma. Now this machine was available on the open market, but the Germans had adapted an, uh, one of the versions of the Enigma to work for themselves. So they were uh, sold to um, embassies and uh, organizations like that. But the Germans uh, modified one of them to work in a special way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. In the meantime, in the late 1930s, as we know, storm clouds were brewing in Europe. And it looked very much like we were going to be at war again with Germany and they needed more personnel to work at Bletchley Park. So what do they do? Well, they put an advert in the newspapers. They, they asked for anybody that was um, that, that could um, uh, that could do, could solve a Daily Telegraph crossword puzzle in less than 12 minutes to apply to the government for secret work. Could they play chess, play bridge? Um, could they work in teams, all that kind of thing. And they would apply to the government. They never knew what it was about, but it was an application for a job, basically. But as the possibility of war uh, drove nearer, they had to move out of central London to somewhere else, to a safe haven. They looked at several sites around London, but they thought, you know, we really have to get right out of the area completely to be safe, because if we are at war, we would be susceptible to bombs from Germany, as we know that uh, in fact did happen. They heard that this house, a house in North Buckinghamshire, had just been purchased by a property developer, um, and they were very interested to move to have a look at this house to see if it was what they wanted, um, because it was uh, they needed a certain. Um, criteria. They needed a direct road into London and you had the old A5 trunk road before the M1 that would go right into central London. Um, also they needed uh, to be in easy access to the big universities. They needed to look for the brilliant mathematicians and linguists that they needed and uh, where this house was located was at Bletchley in Buckinghamshire which was equidistant between Oxford and Cambridge and the big university town. There was a direct train line to London as well that went that goes into Euston, it still does. And there was also a train line between the two university towns of Oxford and Cambridge. So Bletchley Park was an ideal location for them to come to. And on the 15th of August 1939, the Government Code and Cipher School um, came to Bletchley Park to, um, to, to, to actually um, have a look around and make sure that was the site for them. When that was agreed, 175 code breakers moved up from Broadway buildings to Bletchley Park. And that was the date of the move, was August 1939, just prior to the war breaking out. This is Rolf Nosquith. He was born in 1919 in Hametz in Eastern Germany. 
His father, who had the foresight to leave before Hitler came to power, they sold up and uh, moved from Germany to Nottingham in 1932. Rolf went to Trinity College, Cambridge, reading mathematics. And in 1939, he signed up for secret government work and was sent to work at Bletchley Park. He worked in Hut 8 on German naval traffic, which he read thanks to material captured from enemy warships. He played an important part of breaking the U-boat codes during the Battle of the Atlantic. His first billet was at Buckingham and then at Newport Pagnell. Now, he was a member of the Bletchley Park Jewish and Zionist Society. Um, after the war, we'll talk a bit about that later as we go, but after the war, he worked at GCHQ, that's the uh, government communications headquarters at the very beginning of the Cold War. He left GCHQ to join his father's hosiery and lingerie company, which he became a director in 1952. Now, he also has a curious link with Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing, who incidentally was not Jewish, um, but Alan Turing's psychiatrist was uh, Rolf Nosquith's father-in-law. Interesting how things happen. Now, Rolf died at the age of 98 in 2017. Now, another name for Bletchley Park is Station X. Now, Station X means nothing more than Station Number 10, because when um, MI6 moved their code breakers to Bletchley Park, they also moved the diplomatic wireless service, which was a part of MI6, um, that would send messages to our agents and our uh, embassies across Europe. And I always find it quite interesting how we call our agents agents and foreign agents we call spies. But nevertheless, they had this radio station on the roof which they would transmit information to. It wasn't there for very long, as we will see. Now, on the uh, 3rd of September 1939, at 11 o'clock in the morning, most people had their ear by a wireless set to be told by the Prime Minister that we were at war. Uh, once again with Germany. This is Walter Ettenhauser. He was born in Munich in 1910, educated at St Paul's School and became a Don of Queen's College, Oxford. He was called up in September 1940, already being asked to do secret work when he was at university. He lived, at Ox he lived in Oxford. He was enlisted into the tank regiment. He was suddenly ordered to go to Bletchley Park, where he turned up in full tank regiment kit. In February 1941, Walter was one of the first of the Hut 14. He translated German decrypts onto teleprinter tapes and analyzed them onto, into priority order to be sent to the Admiralty. And interestingly enough, Walter transmitted the last, um, sorry, Walter translated the last signal from the German battleship Bismarck from Admiral Lutins to his control at Group North. It stated, we will fight to the last show, long live the Fuhrer. It was suggested that he reverted to civilian because visiting the Admiralty, he will be dealing with top ranking naval officers. It will be difficult to communicate with admirals in the uniform of a trooper in the tank corps. He set up the Zionist Society at Bletchley Park which quite a few Jews attended on a regular basis on a Wednesday evening in Hut 12. More to make sure all Jewish personnel uh, could lead, take leave for the High Holy Day services, um, though there were no uh, services as, as such at Bletchley Park. His brother Ernest worked at Bletchley Park. Now we've got some uh, important information to tell you about Ernest, which will come a little later on in the talk. Now, we spoke about the Enigma machine. Now, if you've been to Bletchley Park, it's quite possible you've seen uh, an Enigma machine. Um, it looks like an old fashioned typewriter in a box, um, weighs about 12 kilograms. Um, when you press a key, instead of a sheet of paper coming out the back, you've got these little lamp, um, uh, little lamp lights here that light up. Now, the idea is when you press a letter, a different letter lights up. You're actually um, uh, encrypting each letter. So if you press a letter C, a letter B light up. Press a letter N, a letter Y might light up. Now, it works like this. Basically, when you press uh, one of the keys, 
the current goes down to this set of plug boards in, in the um, uh, front of the machine. Not too dissimilar to an old-fashioned telephone exchange where you're connecting lines together. In this case, we're changing letters over. So you can see here one letter is connected to another letter, depending on what their code book told them to do. OK, the um, current then goes up to a series of three rotors. It enters this entry disk here through the three rotors, changing the letters on the way through. Eventually, it actually hits this, rope, this reflector. It sends the current back through the rotors on a different path back through that flag board and ultimately lighting up one of these little bulbs on the uh, lamp board here that corresponds with a letter of the alphabet. Now, the possibilities of setting up that machine or even breaking the code are vast. It's 159 million, million, million to one. Now, that code changes every day. And here we have a German wartime code sheet it tells you which rotor to put out, put into which position. That means you could take the rotor out of the uh, unit and put it into a different position. How to set up your plug board, how to set up your rotor. Now, the point is that code at midnight at zero hour GMT will change to the next day's settings and you have to start all over again. So every day <clears throat> at midnight, the code is changed. There wasn't one, just one code book. There were over 170 different code books and radio networks. It was a massive operation. OK, I want to talk now a little bit how Bletchley Park worked. So we know where the codes were coming from. They were coming from, was they coming from the enemy. Now we look at Ger Germ German communications. Now this is uh, General Heinz Guderian in his uh, communications truck. And you can see three people here operating the communications, one to write down the message, one to type it into the Enigma machine and one to send it by radio Morse code. Um, the messages were sent by the standard international radio Morse code, the same dots and dashes that we all know or don't know. But uh, once those messages are in the air, they can be intercepted. And we had these wireless intercept stations all around the country, mainly down the um, east coast of Britain, along the south coast, and somewhere inland as well. Now, these Y stations um, were mainly run by ladies of the armed services, the WAFs, the of the um, uh, the WAFs of the uh, RAF, the RENs, and the ATS, the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the Ladies' Army, in fact. And um, they would get these messages. They had to be very accurate how they wrote them down because these messages um, came in. They didn't know what the messages were about. So they weren't allowed to know what they were about, but they had to be accurate. Now, if you switched a wireless set on in the 1940s, you would have heard a sea of Morse code. Some signals strong, some signals weak, some signals fading, all on top of each other. And these ladies had to make sure they got the messages absolutely correct, because if you write down the wrong letters, you can't decode the signal. But they would, um, once they've written down the messages, they would be stacked up and sent by dispatch rider and later teleprinter as well uh, to Bletchley Park. Once they got to Bletchley Park, they would be sorted. The messages would go to a registry. Now, because the Germans in the early part of the war never encrypted their call signs, we knew their radio frequency the message came from through direction finding, we knew where it was coming from. And so we knew whether it was an army, air force or naval messages, and they would go to different huts. If they were German army or air force messages, they would go to hut six. Hut six would uh, break the code. I know I make it sound easy. It would sometimes take a long, sometimes they, many times they didn't break the code, but many times they did. Once they've broken, broken the code and they extract the plain German text, they are no longer interested. They go on to the next job and they send that message through to Hut 3 for translation and analysis. What was that message about? How important is it? What do we do with it? 
Well, if it was going uh, out to down to the ministries of the, say, for instance, the air ministry or the um, war office or even the admiralty, not a problem. You just put it on the teleprinter. But what if you had to send it abroad? If you had to send it to our commanders in Norway or North Africa, what do you do then? Well, you have to send it by radio. Now, we've already established there's a problem with radio. Anybody can tune in. So we have to encrypt that message onto our system. Our system was called Typex, not Tipex, Typex. Now, the Germans never, ever broke Typex. And it is a miracle they never broke it because to design and build Typex, we had to steal all the patents from the Enigma machine to build it. Um, so what would happen? So we would send the Typex message to our radio station, which was four and a half miles away from Bletchley Park, a place called Wadden Hall. And that MI6 radio station would send that message by shortwave radio wherever it was needed in the world. So the message has been broken and it's, we've now got to inform our commanders about the broken message and about the information we've received. The message is picked up by a special liaison units. They're special trained units to receive the messages that we call uh, ultra. The signals from Bletchley Park were called ultra. Now, just to give you a very quick example here, I hope this is not too complex. Bletchley Park have two ways of getting rid of the message. One, they could disseminate it through sending it by teleprinter down to the Admiralty, the War Office or the Air Ministry. That's one of the ways. That's straightforward. But if they have to send it abroad, they have to re-encrypt it onto the Typex, send it to the radio station, and they would send it to whoever would need that in the field. Now, we call all the disseminated traffic from Bletchley Park, we call it this word here, ultra. And the reason we call it ultra because Winston Churchill stated that what goes on at Bletchley Park is not top secret, it's ultra top secret. And we adopted the word ultra for all the signals that came, um, that went out of uh, Bletchley Park. Joe Gillis was born in Sunderland in 1911. He went to St. Bede's School in Sunderland. He studied at Trinity College, Cambridge, and he was sent to Bletchley Park. He worked in Hut 8 and Hut 10, uh, also involved in the meteorological section. Joe was involved in breaking Luftwaffe codes, um, also on high-grade teleprinter messages from high-ranking German commanders. In 1948, he emigrated to Israel and joined the Zvi Institute, which later became the Wiseman Institute at Rehovot near Tel Aviv, uh, of which he became a professor of applied mathematics. And Joe died in November 1993, aged 82. This is Morris Hoffman. Now, Morris was born in Shoreditch in 1916. He went to the Davenant Foundation School in Whitechapel. Uh, there he studied language, um, he then studied languages at Birkbeck College in London. When war broke out, he was called for an interview with Commander Saunders of the Royal Navy at 54 Broadway buildings, not realizing this was the headquarters of the Secret Service. As Morris was an expert on the German language on the 12th of February 1942, he was sent to Bletchley Park. He was billeted at Leighton Buzzard in Bedfordshire. At Bletchley Park, he worked in Hut 3, analyzing trans and translating German code received from Hut 6. Part of his work exposed the complete order of battle of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. He was appalled one day when he was shown a captured German book where the spine had been made out of a destroyed Sefer Torah. As there was no kosher food available, uh, he became a vegetarian during his stay at Bletchley. He used to attend Zionist meetings at the flat of Joe Gillis. One day the police arrived as they suspected it was a meeting of fifth columnists. They must have had ex some extreme uh, explaining to do there. After the war, he worked for the Ministry of Health. In later life, Morris obtained a degree in Hebrew language at, at the University College in London. He was also asked to assist with the translation of historic Jewish documents. In 1956, he became an active member of Barnett Synagogue, for which he eventually became a life president. 
Morris died in London in February 2014, aged 98. Ruth Seabag Montefiore. Now, she was born in London in 1915 and educated at Notting Hill High School and Burgess Hill School near Brighton. Ruth did secretarial work before the war, then she was recommended to apply for a job at the Foreign Office in 1939. After an interview at Broadway Buildings, the MI6 headquarters for an unknown posting, she was sent to Bletchley Park. In the very early days, Ruth found herself working in the Bletchley Park mansion itself. Ruth later worked in Hut 10. She was also involved with special operations sending coded messages to and from our agents in enemy lands. After the war, Ruth worked as a sub-editor of the children's book Chateau and Windrush in London. And by coincidence, her great uncle, who was Herbert Samuel Leon, was the first a former owner of Bletchley Park. And Ruth died in 2015, aged 100. Staff at Bletchley Park. Well, if you've been to Bletchley Park, you've got a rough idea of the size of it. It was a little bit uh, larger in, than you, you see nowadays, um, but it did actually employ almost 10 thousand staff. Now obviously everybody didn't work there at the same time, there was a shift system and there was holidays and people working away. But out of that 10,000 staff, 200 personnel were Jewish, which is a very high proportion indeed. And out of the 10,000 staff, 85% were military staff. Uh, that's the, um, and a very high proportion of those were the ladies of the armed services, especially the Wrens. The Wrens were the highest proportion of ladies that worked at Bletchley Park. In fact, 75%, uh, it says there 75% were Wrens, or 75% uh, were ladies working there from the services, and a very high proportion of them were actually Wrens. Now, I felt quite sorry for the Wrens because they, they joined the Navy probably to be somewhere near the sea, a port somewhere. Maybe get a bit of sunshine, you can get down, get a bit of a suntan. <laughs> well, they were all stationed at HMS Pembroke 5. Now that sounds like a ship, doesn't it? But it wasn't. It was the Royal Navy's name for Bletchley Park and Bletchley's two outstations at Stanmore and Eastcote. In fact, you couldn't be further from the sea if you tried. Now, Everybody who worked at Bletchley Park had to sign the official Secrets Act, which swore them to secrecy for life. Now, I know the story came out after 30 years, but um, some of the veterans that come to visit us at Bletchley Park still won't tell us anything. They say, we signed the act. We're, gonna, uh, we're not going to say anything. We'll take the, we're going to take the story to the grave. But some people, thankfully, do tell us the story. This is Phyllis Wicks. She was born in 1923, lived in Stamford Hill in North London, and she went to Hilburn High, Hilburn High School and then to the London School of Economics. She was simply called for an interview at 54 Broadway Buildings. One day, she later found out this was the head of British intelligence. She never knew that at the time. And she was asked about her interests in chess and bridge and working in teams, etc. cetera. Um, she was then, uh, she then received a letter to appear at Bletchley Railway Station at a certain time where she was met and taken to Bletchley Park. Phyllis worked the shift system in Hut 6, sorting out teleprinter tapes into order ready for the decoders. Philip used a mock-up of the Enigma machine called Typex. Now, you know the Typex machine I showed you earlier on. You can actually modify that to work as if it is an Enigma machine. So she used one of those machines looking for cribs, which were a known uh, or guessed phrases, dates, clues into that particular message that the, the Germans were using. Phyllis, Phyllis was billeted at Woburn Sands, which is very close to Bletchley. Socially, she remembered meetings at the flat with Joe Gillis. Um, we've got no other information about uh, Phyllis. In fact, um, we know her son, but her mother's request was not to divulge any other information about Bletchley. So I'm afraid that's all we have at this moment in time. Now, one of the things when I um, guide at Bletchley Park, one of the questions we asked 
is, were there any Americans working at Bletchley Park? Well, Churchill didn't want to give Ultra, which was a name for our disseminated traffic, Ultra codes to the Americans because uh, Churchill believed the Americans would be gung-ho, the, the, uh, they would use the code without thinking, and um, the Germans would change the code. They'd realize we'd broken the code, so he didn't really want to do it. But it was a problem because we needed information from the Americans. We needed to exchange our ultra information with their version of ultra, which was called magic, because the American code breakers were known as magicians. So we needed that because we needed Japanese information. So almost a year before America came into the war, there was a meeting at Bletchley Park with some top American personnel. Now from right to left here, uh, these American code breakers. You've got this chap here. This is Leo Rosen. He uh, worked, he was one of the top, these are all top code breakers from the, from the United States. Um, Leo Rosen, he became after the war a professor of mathematics at the Arizona State University. Then here we have Solomon Kulbach. After the war, he stayed with the United States intelligence, uh, but also taught mathematics at the George Washington uh, University. And this is Captain uh, Abraham Sinkoff. After 32 years with the National Security Agency in America, he became a professor of applied mathematics at Arizona, Arizona State. This is William F. Friedman. Now he was the United States, Ar United States Army Chief cryptographer who ran the research division of the Army's signal intelligence. And after the war, he became the chief cryptanalyst of the United States National Security Agency. He was Mr. Big in code breaking in the United States. And they all um, worked at Bletchley Park. Jewish personnel all worked at Bletchley Park during the war. Not for a long period. They were there just for a short period. But there were... Um, 203 American personnel working there, and quite a few of them were Jewish as well. Okay, a little bit about what the, the war. Um, basically, um, Hitler wanted to invade Britain at the time. He wanted it was a seaborne operation called Operation Zealover or Sea Lion. Um, to do that, he needed to destroy the RAF. He couldn't have the RAF if he uh, overhead if he was going to have this seaborne operation. And uh, he ordered his uh, commander in charge of the um, German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring, to um, attack Britain, attack the RAF, and try and destroy the RAF. Well, we passed that information on to Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding, the um, in charge of uh, Fighter Command. He was based at Stanmore, as you may well know, and because the Battle of Britain ensured, and they were using Ultra because we knew what the Germans were up to. Now, if you're going to have a war in a desert, this is Irving Rommel. Uh, he was known as a desert fox. Uh, he needed good supply lines. He's in the desert. He needs ammunition. He needs food for his, his uh, troops. And we knew where his supply lines were because we were reading Italian Enigma. The Italians were also using Enigma. And uh, we knew that the Italians were delivering his supplies to North African ports. And we got the Royal Navy and the Air Force to sink his ships, making him very short of uh, supplies. And the Battle of Al Alamein, he, where he retreated, he just ran out of supplies. Um, I've got a picture here of Henry Jacobs. Now, Henry Jacobs had nothing whatsoever to do with uh, Bletchley Park, but he was my uncle and he was killed in North Africa and I use him just as a, uh, a memorial to all the Jewish people that died at El Alamein. So that's why I put uh, Uncle Henry, the Uncle Henry that I never knew uh, on this slide. Okay, um, this lady here, she's not Jewish, but she's got a kind of Jewish name. Her name is um, Ma um, Mavis Lever. She worked at Bletchley Park in one of the cold drafty huts and one day she um, uh, she was working on an Italian message in code and she broke this code and she realized the Italians were going to um, attack the British 
at Crete, a big convoy of Italian warships were going to secretly attack the British fleet at Crete. Well, that message was passed on to Admiral Andrew Cunningham, who, um, once he got that message, he was based in Alexandria. He knew Alexandria was a hotbed of spies. Had he moved the fleet during the day, that would have got back to the Italians. So he pretended to go and play a game of golf, made sure everyone saw him leave the port, even checked into a hotel with some dummy suitcases. But when nightfall came, he took the whole fleet out. He caught the Italians napping. He gave the Italians the biggest bashing they ever got. He virtually wrecked the Italian Navy in one go. It's called the Battle of Cape Matapan. Um, it, was the, it, it was basically the biggest battle since the Battle of Jutland and the biggest uh, victory, Churchill said, since Trafalgar. Um, and all because this lady had worked out what the Germans were up to. Well, Churchill came to visit Bletchley Park in uh, September 1941. He was very impressed with what was going on. There had been some big successes through the code breaking, but there was a problem. Alan Turing, who you probably all heard of, the brilliant mathematician who was working in Hut 8 on uh, naval enigma. Naval enigma was a very, very difficult form of enigma to break. He worked out this figure of uh, 159 million, million million was a needle in a haystack. And he said the best way to remove a needle from a haystack is to remove the hay. And he invented a machine that would remove all the possibilities that the code wasn't. And that machine was called a bomb machine, not a good machine to use for a machine during the war because it had nothing to do with high explosives. Um, Alan Turing invented this machine. Um, Gordon Welchman, top left hand side of the um, picture there, um, this chap here, Gordon Welchman, he made the machine work even better. Though it worked, he made it work better. And this is Harold Keane. Harold Keane was the uh, production manager of the British tabulating machine company in Letchworth in Hertfordshire, who built these massive bomb machines. They weigh about a ton with 11 miles of cable in. And at the initially, we had six at Bletchley Park breaking Enigma codes. They represent 36 Enigma machines. And they could break codes very quickly indeed. But the problem was we were getting thousands and thousands of codes in every day and we were only we only had six of these machines so a lot of the work wasn't getting done the code breakers complained to the boss commander Al Alistair Denniston who was the boss at Bletchley Park and the, and Denniston said you know um, I can't buy any more of these machines because I would have to go to the foreign office to get the money the foreign office would ask me what it's for and I can't tell them but the code breakers realized by not breaking the codes, it would cost lives. And uh, they were very, very frustrated when they were told to carry on the best they could. Well, they knew that Churchill had been to Bletchley Park, so they decided to write a letter to Rector Winston Churchill. And it was taken to the, to the 10 Downing Street. Now, they were the, I can remember the days you could walk down Downing Street and knock on the door. You can't get anywhere near that place now. But this chap here, Stuart Milner Barry, had the job to take the letter, uh, explaining how desperate they were, short of resources at Bletchley. He had to take that to the Prime Minister. He knocked on the door. He was told that the Prime Minister would not see anybody. Um, he couldn't even say where he came from. He wasn't allowed to say he came from Bletchley Park. And he handed the letter to the Prime Minister's secretary. And he thought, being the civil service that... Uh, that uh, Churchill would never see that letter, but Churchill did see that letter and he was very concerned because he believed the staff at Bletchley Park were the geese that laid the golden eggs and never cackled because no one was allowed to talk about it and he supported Bletchley Park. And he was so um, uh, annoyed that they were short of resources, he stamped that letter, action this day and that's the actual letter there copy of the letter and that's Churchill's handwriting that says quite clearly make sure they have all they want on urgent priority 
and get back to me, report back to me when it's been done. He handed that letter to his chief of staff, General Ismay, and from that point onwards, uh, funds started rolling into Bletchley Park and they built over 211 bomb machines. Now, only six were ever at Bletchley Park. The majority were at um, were split between um, Stanmore, a site at Stanmore in North London and East Coast. And one of those operators who operated the bomb machine at, um, at East Goat was Ruth Bourne. Now, Ruth Bourne, she was born in 1926 and lived in Birmingham. At the commencement of war, Ruth enlisted, enlisted into the Rains. She trained at Bletchley Park and she became one of the 1600 Rains working on the bomb machines. Ruth um, uh, worked at the outstation at East Coast in Middlesex. Um, recently, she was uh, also, now I can tell you now, she is 94 years old and she retired last year from being a guide at Bletchley Park. She was a guide and she now works um, also giving talks like I do around the country. And um, she's also working at the National Museum of Computing <laughs> Uh, giving occasional talks, because she lives in North Finchley, she gives occasional talks about the bomb machine and how it works. But Ruth told me an interesting story. Um, when she worked uh, at Bletchley, and she used to go home on leave, and she lived in Birmingham at the time, and her mother used to, um, used to ask her, so where are you working? She said, well, I can't tell you. Well, what are you doing? You can tell me. I'm your mother, you can tell me. She said, had she told her mother, within 10 minutes, the whole of Birmingham would have found out. <laughs> they, she, she never told her mother what she did. Um, Ruth now lives in North Finchley, and she's a member of Finchley Reform Synagogue. And that's Ruth Bourne. Okay, Battle of the Atlantic. Now, we can't really talk about Bletchley Park unless um, you must mention the Battle of the Atlantic, because it was so important to break the code of the German U-boats or German submarines that were sinking our shipping fleets. Uh, they were sinking our shipping fleets. Um, we had supply lines, that all our uh, goods, our services were coming to Britain and the U-boats were sinking all our merchant ships. Um, Germany uh, also had their code breaking section called BDN, so be uh, Beobachtungdienst, they have these big long German words, but Beobachtungdienst was the German um, version of Bletchley Park, but only for the Navy. Each German service had their own code breaking organization. The Air Force had theirs, the Abwehr, the spy uh, unit had theirs, the Navy had theirs, and none of them spoke to each other. <laughs> so they didn't break many codes, but they did break a few of them. And one of the ones they broke was our naval code three and seven, which told the Germans exactly where our merchant ships were. And we had big, big problems in the Battle of the Atlantic. But thanks to uh, Alan Turing and his team at Hut 8, Hut 8 broke a very, very um, comprehensive type of uh, German enigma. Um, what the German Navy would do is they put their messages into a code before they actually um, put them through the Enigma machine. So the messages become super enciphered. And this is someone who worked there. This is Harry Gollenbeck. Harry Gollenbeck, born in 1911 in Lambeth in London. His parents came from Russia. He attended Wilson's Grammar School in Camberwell. He studied philology at King's College London. That's a structure and historical relationship between different languages. At the outbreak of war, he joined the Royal Artillery. He became, um, well, because of his mathematical skills, he was recruited uh, by the Government Code and Cipher School at Bletchley Park. At Bletchley, he helped break the Abwehr uh, code used by the German spy network. He also worked in Hut 8 with Alan Turing to break the most difficult code of all. That's the German Enigma, German Naval Enigma. Um, he was a brilliant chess player, and after the war, he wrote many books on chess, and he became the Times chess correspondent. Harry died in Chalfant St. Charles in Buckinghamshire, aged 84, in 1995. This is Peter Hilton. 
Peter Hilton was the youngest codebreaker at Bletchley Park. He was born in 1923. He was a son of the Elizabeth Friedman and Mortimer Hilton and educated at St Paul's School, where he won a scholarship to Queen's College, Oxford. At Oxford, a team of MI6 were recruiting on behalf of the Government Code and Cipher School. He accepted and aged 18, he arrived at Bletchley Park. He was initially put to work on Naval Enigma in Hut 8, and in 1942 he transferred his work to German teleprinter ciphers. He, um, this was a special section where he worked with Max Newman and Jack Good, and we'll explain who they were in a moment. After the war, he became a distinguished professor of mathematics at the State University of New York. Um, he died um, aged 87 in 2010. So once we started attacking the U-boats, um, we became very, very successful. We were breaking the codes and attacking the boats. This caused a problem because the commander of the U-boats, Carl Dernitz, Admiral Dernitz, he suspected that we were breaking the codes. And on the 1st of February 1942, they changed the codes on their U-boats, which meant to say we were losing the vast majority of our imported stock to the bottom of the land, Atlantic. The majority of our stock was ending up on the bottom of the Atlantic. This was causing a problem. We were losing the war. We needed a miracle and we needed it quick. And luckily, and just by the stroke of luck, we tracked down these four very brave guys, tracked down a U-boat in the Eastern Mediterranean and um, it was, um, HMS Petard um, actually found, located this U-boat, U-559, brought it to the surface by attacking it, and these uh, four guys climbed on board the submarine after the prisoners were taken off, and they recovered the code books that we needed so, so desperately. Unfortunately, in this incident, two of the uh, seamen um, Colin Grazier on the right hand side there and First, Luke, uh, First Lieutenant Anthony Fasson died in that when the submarine actually rolled over and sunk. But they did recover the code books. They were awarded posthumously. They got the George Cross. Uh, Tommy Brown on the left hand side there got the George Medal and Kenneth LaCroix, who was an ASDIC operator, sonar operator, was mentioned in dispatches. But with that sad uh, occurrence, we recovered the code books. And then, just a couple of months later, we had all out war on the U boats. We were going to actually get rid of the U boats out in the Atlantic once and for all. We had this American aircraft to help us, a long range aircraft called the Liberator. And within a couple of months, we sunk over 100 U boats, and the U boats uh, were recalled out of the Atlantic by Dönitz, some went to the Mediterranean, some went to Norway, because it was too unsafe to have the U-boat. It's virtually the end of the Battle of the Atlantic. It was always dangerous in the Atlantic, but basically it was the end. We'll just talk very briefly about some new challenges. Um, Hitler would send his messages to his generals using a machine called the Lorenz machine. The Lorenz machine, a million times more powerful than Enigma, 12 rotor machine. Uh, but it did send battle plans and this high-grade intelligence. It was broken by these two guys here. This is Colonel John Tiltman and this is Bill Tutt. Um, they broke the code, but the code had to be regularly broken and it's broken by uh, a team of people which we'll talk about now. This is Jack Good. Irving John Good, known as Jack Good, born in London 1916. His parents were immigrant shopkeepers uh, he studied at, he studied mathematics at Jesus College, Cambridge. He worked at, he worked initially in Hut 8 with Alan Turing, then moved to the F block, the Newman Marine, named after its team leader, Max Newman. As a, as a cryptanalyst, he worked on high-grade teleprinter messages from Hitler and his high command. Okay, Jack worked on the uh, Colossus machines, the world's first digital electronic computers installed at Bletchley Park, uh, sending out Hitler's most secret messages. Post-war, he worked as a professor of statistics at Manchester University, 
with Max Newman and Alan Turing working on the world's first fully programmable computers. Um, but at the same time, he was also working at TCHQ and at Trinity College, Oxford. He later became, um, he, he, um, he later worked at the University of West uh, Virginia. He died in 2009, aged 92. <coughs> and of course, Max Newman. Max Newman, where his full title is Professor Maxwell Herman Newman, Fellow of the Royal Society, but to us, Bletchley Parkers, he's known as Max Newman. In 1923, become a fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge. And he was also at Cambridge, he was the lecturer to Alan Turing. So it shows you uh, the intellect of these people. Max worked on breaking the Lorenz cipher machine, which, was, which Hitler sent his top high grade messages to his generals, which was so terribly important for D-Day. Um, he later had his own department called the Numenry in Block F at Bletchley Park to mechanize the operation. Newman worked in conjunction with the telecommunications research establishment in Malvern in Worcestershire and the post office experimental establishment in North London at Dollis Hill to initiate the building of the world's first digital electronic computer, Colossus, built by Tommy Flowers and his team at the GPO. So there's the... Uh, Colossus machine there. After the war, Max worked at um, the uh, Manchester University with Jack Good and Alan Turing to build the first computer, uh, first programmable computers called the Manchester Baby and the Manchester One. Max died in February 1984, aged 87. So we're coming to the end of the war now. And just to finalize a couple of more things I'd like to say, um, the Colossus machine was breaking the codes to help Operation Overlord D-Day. We needed, if you know, D-Day was a, a deception. We had to, D, D stands for day. For the day of the battle is D-Day, but it was a deception. And we had to be ensured that Hitler under, understood or, 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 or took the biscuit, if you like, for the deception. And we knew that by breaking the codes. Okay, 1945, Bletchley Park was stood down. The staff were transferred to East Coast which became the first GCHQ. And then from East Coast, um, they moved to several sites at Cheltenham, and now they're at the Donut Building at Cheltenham. So Bletchley Park was the first GCHQ, and they moved on, and now they're at Cheltenham. Also, obviously, now still very, very secret indeed. I like to think that Bletchley Park was the start of the computer age, um, because of the Colossus computer was the first digital computer in the world operating at Bletchley Park and uh, but I think the jewel in the crown for Bletchley Park was on the 15th of July 2011 when Her Majesty the Queen and the um, his right honourable Duke, Duke of Edinburgh uh, came to Bletchley Park and um, there's the Queen being demonstrated the Enigma machine by our Ruth Bourne and you can see Ruth there actually demonstrated uh, to the to the Queen how the Enigma worked. Now I did say I'd talk a little bit more about uh, Walter Ettenhausen. Okay now Walter Ettenhausen, he was involved after the war, post-war, he was involved during the siege of Jerusalem in the 1948 War of Independence. At Lucerne, uh, at Lucerne he headed the, he, oh he changed his name by the way to Walter Aiton, E-Y-T-A-N. And um, at Lucerne in 1949, he headed the Israeli delegation and signed the first agreement with, a, um, with an Arab country. And of course, that was Egypt. And then the foreign minister, Moshe Sharat, asked him to become director general of the Israeli foreign ministry, which he did for 11 years. And then from 1959 to 1970, uh, to 1970, he became the Israeli ambassador, ambassador to France. Oh, yeah. He eventually, um, he eventually became the perm permanent secretary of the Israeli Foreign Office. Okay. Um, one day, his old friend from Bletchley Park visited him. Um, Rolf Nosquist, the first chap I talked spoke about today, visited him at Bletchley Park, and Rolf asked him if he'd like any assistance with any, with anything. And apparently Walter replied, don't worry, code breakers, we have plenty. 
Okay, I'd just like to finish by saying, um, from intelligence point of view, uh, Winston Churchill never uh, wanted to, from intelligence point of view, Winston Churchill never wanted to give ultra intelligence to anybody. So the question remains why the British Secret Service, who were so particular to employ so many, Jew uh, so many Jewish personnel at Bletchley Park, as many of them were coming from Eastern Europe, quite a few of them from um, Germany, apart, apart from uh, England and America. Was it because of their knowledge of Yiddish? Well, maybe. Was it because of their uh, superior intellect? Well, you can say almost certainly. <laughs> but the one main reason why the British Secret Service MI6 were, deploy, were to employ over 200 personnel at the ultra top secret Bletchley Park out of the 10,000 staff, which incidentally happened to be one fifth higher than the national average of Jewish pe people in the country at the time, was that no Jew would ever side with Hitler. Thank you very much. Michael, uh, thank you so much. What a fascinating story. Uh, as I said, I visited Bletchley Park, but uh, what a wonderful insight that was. A fascinating wartime story. Uh, one of the sage objectives is to educate and entertain and I've said that before and I think you've done that in a bucket load this afternoon. It's, uh, it's nice to see and nice to hear about Jewish people making such a major contribution to the war effort and particularly at Bletchley Park because the work that, done, that was done there, uh, they helped, I, I can't remember, I've heard people say shorten the war by uh, quite a number of years if I remember rightly. So I'm happy to take questions. If, if you want to do some questions, I'm happy to take questions so, if you've got time. Okay, I'm now coming on to that. So if there are people who'd like to ask questions, either sort of unmute yourself or wave your hand about, and we will try and get to you. Yeah. While, while people are thinking of something really fantastic to ask me, I can mention my book. Okay, I have a book, Bletchley Park, The Jewish Contribution, which tells the story and history of Bletchley Park and all the Jewish personnel that operated there uh, are in this book. It's available, just contact me by email and I'll tell you how to get one. So it's Bletchley Park, Jewish Contribution, the book which I wrote in conjunction with Martin Sugarman, the official um, historian for the Ajax, Ajax okay. uh, organised all right. servicemen. Uh, so if they want we will, it, we, we, will give, we will give people your email address as we did for somebody last week and they can contact you directly and make those arrangements. That's okay. Right. Anybody got a question? Yes, Stuart. Go on, Brian. Um, it's not really questions, actually, but just perhaps confirmation, because I did visit there with Ruth Bourne, and she took this one very interesting thing. Apparently, um, they were considerably helped because the Polish um, people actually sent an Enigma machine over. Um, so they actually had an Enigma machine. I think that was in the 1939 or around about then, and that was a big help to them. And the other thing, um, I wonder if, if this was true. Apparently, once or twice, they knew information which would save lives, but they couldn't pass it on because if they had passed it on, it would be quite clear that they'd broken the code. Um, and I don't know if um, that can be confirmed now by our, our speaker yeah. today. Okay, I'll answer it. First of all, about the Polish question. The Polish, um, I do a talk on, on the Polish section. Yes, the Polish were a big help, um, they they never actually sent us a machine over though. <laughs> they never sent us a machine. It would have been nice if they had done. We've got it now. It's in the Polish legation in uh, near Hammersmith. It, it, it is there now. But uh, what happened is the Polish, um, prior to the war breaking out, were breaking the German military enigma. And um, of course, when the war broke out, they had to. They they were they um, went to France before Germany invaded France and we had a link with them, but they never actually came to Bletchley Park. They never came, they weren't allowed, we don't know why, uh, they never came to Bletchley Park, um, but we had a lot of uh, information, but they built their own Enigma machine uh, from, there were three brilliant Polish um, code breakers, Marian, Marian Rajewski, Jerzy Rezicki and Henryk Zagowski and they passed information back to Britain. So yes, we did get a big help from the Polish. I tell the Polish story. So if at a later date, if you want me back, I'll tell the story about the Polish link. And there is a good link. But they didn't actually work at Bletchley Park. We don't quite know why, 
but I've got my um, uh, kind of thoughts on that. Um, the uh, other part is, yes, um, we had to be careful how we used Ultra. We couldn't, uh, there are two occasions, I'm just reading a, a book which is not a, <laughs> a very difficult book to read, new book on GCHQ, Enigma of GCHQ, it only came out very recently. And uh, they're saying, GCHQ says there were two main times when Ultra could not be used for that very reason that you, uh, that you mentioned, Brian. But um, uh, because we couldn't let the Germans know that, in fact, um, that we'd broken it. Because if they changed the code, we would have been a lot worse off. But it has been uh, said that um, it wasn't used in major battle. That didn't stop us uh, having major battles. There were incidences where it wasn't used. But that's all we know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah, Morris. Okay, go on. Go on, Morris, we can, hit, we can see you. Can you turn your microphone on, please, Morris? Thank you. Um, Michael Kushner, you said that you were in charge of the computer exhibition at Bletchley Park, is that correct? No, I'm not in charge of the computer I I'm now... I was a, a guide at Bletchley Park for 14 years and I've now retired from Bletchley Park but they have a computer museum there as well, the National Museum of Computing and I now give lectures there. Oh, well in the National Computing Museum you might come across the earlier 920B. Uh, yes, 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 yes. It's well, not yeah. well I, I commissioned the first 920B up at Elliot's in Boreham Wood, if that's of interest. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That, yeah. The, the, the computers at Bletchley Park, the computer museum at Bletchley Park's in two sections. One is the wartime section of the wartime computers that we're telling you about. The other section is about computers after the war. And one is the Elliot computer that uh, Morris was just talking about. And uh, yeah, that is it. I'm not a great, um, I have not, I have, I haven't got great knowledge of modern <clears throat> computing, but I do know about Colossus. That's but good. someone flashed on the screen just now that their sister worked in uh, uh, Bletchley Park. And I'm just going to very quickly look in my book. So if they could do that again, just tell me who that was. That was Jeffrey uh, Rothband who put what the was the, on. What was the name of the, la the, the lady? Tell me the name. He's asking a question. Your sister's name. Ma Myra Rothbound. How, how are you spelling that? R O. I'm just having a look while while you're actually very on there. So. R O T H B A N D. Right, there's. Uh, I can't quite find it here. I'd like to. Could could you do me a favour and just send me an email with that information on? Because yeah. if I can't find it in the book, I need to know why why I can't find it, and we need to look into the records. Just if you could kindly send me an email, it might be there and I just couldn't see it, but uh, send me an email with her name on and I, I, will, I will communicate that with you and we'll, we'll, we'll check the records and find out why I haven't got that. We'll get, De get Daphne to send you his email address. We will need right, her, name, her, 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 her name as it was at the time, not if she was married or single at the time, we'll need her name, but we'll check that. What we can do is I can check the Bletchley Park record and then uh, we'll look at what the Foreign Office have got as well. We'll have a look, see what we can find. Okay, okay we'll do that. Okay, any more? Okay. Anybody else? Any no? questions? Okay. Michael, thank you once again for a fascinating insight to Bletchley Park. Uh, we will distribute your email address and allow people to contact you directly about getting the book. Can I just remind everybody once again next week to stay on after this, uh, after the talk from Ilana. Uh, just to say, Michael, we had one of our biggest audiences today, so yes. clearly it's uh, of keen <laughs> interest to people and a fascinating story and uh, you've done justice to it as well. Thank you so much. Okay. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed and thank you for inviting me. Hello, Michael. Michael. It's Daphne now, just to say on my behalf, thank you very, very much. It was fascinating and interesting. And as Stuart said, our strap line is, 
it's never too late to learn and we certainly learned a lot of things today so thank you very much indeed yeah i'll, I'll also send you my list of talks in case you find any other lovely that's oh, great thank we, you we, we, thank we you. never refuse we never refuse offers like that michael we'll be back okay. on to you. <laughs> thank you can i ask something Who, who's this Anne. Anne Kastler. go on Anne. yeah i used to live in pinner and my husband and i regularly walked past that East Coast Nissan Hat place, and we always wondered what it was. We always used to think it was some secret service thing. It was. <laughs> and it was. What, what exactly was <laughs> it at East Coast? What exactly was it? Right, okay. Well, basically, it's at Pembroke Way. Do you know Pembroke Way? No, it was in the main road, East Coast. Okay, well, if it was Pembroke, well, it may have been connected to it because what you've got to remember, anything to do with Bletchley Park was ultra top secret. But also, you've got to remember, after the war, it became GCHQ. So it was probably part of that. Okay. So you, you, you wouldn't really know about it. But all we know now that it's, there's a housing estate at Pembroke Park. And if you remember, I said Pembroke 5 was the Royal Navy's name for the... Um, <laughs> For the um, for Bletchley Park and its outstations, so it's now called Pembroke Way. <laughs> yes, you're right because the place I know they have turned it into a housing estate. Thank you very much. A fascinating mm -hmm. uh, lecture. Thank you're you. Welcome. Mm -hmm. much, much like Stanmore in reality, Stanmore yes, used to be Stanmore. the RAF yes, base yes. and it yeah. and is now a grand housing yeah. estate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Michael, thank you once again. Look forward perhaps okay. to seeing you again in the future. Keep well. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone, and thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.